Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. Today's story is about a 19-year-old who disappeared back in 2016. He hasn't been seen since, except some bizarre sightings around the day of his disappearance. You know I always find these kind of cases intriguing, how someone can just up and vanish. Sometimes it's by choice, other times it's against their will. There's always a lot of speculation in these ones. My sources are listed in the description area. This is the case of Logan Schindelman. This story takes us back to 2016. I've told you guys before that 2016 was one of my favorite years personally. Pokemon Go was all the rage. Obama was president. The world lost David Bowie and Prince. Harambe the Gorilla was a big news story. The Chicago Cubs won the World Series. And lastly, it was the first time in 50 years that grocery store prices were less expensive than the year before. Prices actually went down in 2016. Logan Schindelman was born June 27, 1996 in Olympia, Washington. Just some backstory on Logan's family. I'm going to discuss Logan's race because it ties into the story. Logan at one point in his life begins to have an identity crisis of some sort, which we'll get into. Logan's grandmother is a woman named Ginny. Ginny has a daughter named Hannah. Hannah is Logan's mother, and she is mixed race. Her mother, Ginny, is white, and her father is black. Hannah has a daughter named Chloe, and then she had a son named Logan. Logan's father is a man from Saudi Arabia. He was working temporarily in the United States as an engineer on a limited visa, he and Hannah have a short fling, and then he goes back to Saudi Arabia. Hannah discovers she is pregnant. I don't know anything else about Logan's father, but his dad is not in the picture and likely doesn't even know that he has a son at all. Now, Chloe and Logan are going to live with their grandmom, Jenny, for a majority of their life. Their mother, Hannah, was still involved in their life. She just moved to Seattle so she could go to art school. The two kids still went and visited her, and she would visit them. Grandmom Ginny just had full-time custody of them. They lived in Tumwater, Washington. Tumwater is about two hours away from Seattle, where their mom lived. I actually found Hannah's Facebook page, and she is truly an amazing artist. Her paintings look like something you'd find framed at an art show. She's, like, really talented. She eventually did move back to Olympia, which is like 15 minutes from where her mom and her children live in Tumwater. So Logan is raised with his white grandmother, and the area that they live in is predominantly white at over 85%. Only 2% is African American. Ginny says Logan didn't care that he was the only person of color in their household, and it didn't have any impact on him whatsoever. Logan was this awesome football player in high school and led his school to the state championships twice. He is described as being popular, fun, always smiling, lots of friends, and athletic. Just a great kid who enjoyed listening to music and writing poetry. Logan graduated high school in 2015 and is going to college in the fall. But towards the end of the school year, Logan had a turning point in his life. He attended a late night party with some friends. This party is outside and there's a bonfire going, just 18 year olds drinking and hanging out and doing what 18 year olds have been doing for centuries. Suddenly a girl at the party begins to insult Logan. She thinks she's just being cute and funny, but she wasn't at all. She was making racial remarks and said things like, well, you're Saudi Arabian. Aren't you supposed to be dancing around the fire? She was just being a total ass towards Logan and making fun of him. Understandably, Logan was really bothered by this. He called his grandmother, Ginny, and asked her to come pick him up. Now, it wasn't so much what this girl said to him that he was upset about. 
He was upset that not one single friend said anything or stood up for him. Logan had believed these were his true friends. Logan tells his grandmother, they weren't even there for me. I thought they were my friends. Why didn't they say anything? He felt like they weren't doing their job. Logan would have stood up for them in a heartbeat, but here this girl is making fun of his race and no one bothers to jump in. Remember, Logan is the only person of color in this whole group. His grandmother said he had never really experienced racism before, and now that he has, he is hurt. They should have thrown her out of the party and told her not to come back. Logan is upset and decides to cut off communication with everyone he thought was his friend. They message him, and they can see that he's read their messages, but he never responds. His friends know he's deliberately ignoring them, and this was a real turning point for Logan and truly opened his eyes. His grandmother says at this point he began having an identity crisis and was trying to figure out just who he was. I went to Logan's Facebook page. He posts about the normal things any 17 to 19 year old would post, music, sports, some art stuff. He seemed like a really cool kid. Logan begins to isolate himself from everyone except his grandmother and sister who live with him. He spends a lot of time in his bedroom listening to music, watching movies, and playing on his phone and his computer. Logan graduated from high school in 2015, and at this point, Logan is now a freshman at Eastern Washington University, but a lot of his former friends from high school went there, and it's awkward, and he doesn't like passing them on campus. He decides to switch to Washington State University. Him leaving and going to Washington State University would ensure no one would know him since it's 300 miles away. But after a year, he decided it wasn't for him. He's struggling with his grades and missing classes and decided to come back home. If he didn't leave college on his own, he would have been kicked out anyway due to how bad his grades were. Now, this is very different for Logan. Remember, he had been an honor student in high school who was popular and played sports, and now he's failing in school and he doesn't have any real friends. Logan is going to work various jobs during this time and see the world as an adult. He had a job working for a laundry facility where he would go around and collect laundry from nursing homes and hospitals, and then he'd wash them and return them. He also worked part-time on his aunt and uncle's farm. They said he was a great worker and enjoyed working hard. They paid him $20 an hour, which is great money for any 19-year-old in 2016. When Logan moved back to his grandmom's after leaving college, he learns that his sister Chloe had moved her boyfriend and his two kids in the house. Her boyfriend's name is Jake. Now, Logan isn't too happy about this now that there's this new man and two little kids in the house, and I can't say I blame him, to be honest. He and Jake didn't get along. So back in 2013, Jake was charged with domestic assault and other assault charges. It had been a few years since his last charge, and I'm not sure what the reason was that Logan didn't like him, but he and Logan, again, didn't get along well. Now, Ginny says reports of them not getting along are escalated. Jake was not violent in the home or doing anything that he shouldn't. She said Logan and Jake didn't like each other, but generally avoided one another with Logan staying in his room most of the time to avoid Jake and his two little kids. Logan's Uncle Mike said Logan hated Jake living there and there was a lot of hostility between the two. They never came to blows, but they just didn't like one another and it was just kind of awkward to be around. Logan is smoking a lot of pot during this time. I don't think it's a big deal for most people, but his grandmother said it made him nervous and paranoid, and she would know him better than anyone else. He claims someone was watching him from his bedroom window, and she said it was the marijuana that made him feel that way. Logan is going to parties and staying out all night, and even though he was going to parties and meeting a lot of new people, he was having trouble making new friends. It was like these parties were just full of acquaintances. Logan had set out to meet some of his grandfather's family. Remember, Ginny had a relationship with a black man, which produced her daughter, Hannah, who was Logan's mom. He set up a meeting with his great aunt, Tina. This would be his grandfather's sister. He wanted to meet the African-American side of the family he had never met before. She had him over for dinner, and they spent time looking at photos of his grandfather and other family photos. She said Logan told her, 
It feels so good to see pictures of people who look like me. She also said Logan told her not to let his grandmother Jenny know he was here because she would be upset. Aunt Tina sees Jenny as trying to keep him from that side of the family while he was growing up. She says Logan wanted answers about his African-American side of the family and Jenny wasn't giving them to him. Jenny contests this and says Logan has always been here and they made no effort to contact him while he was growing up. She said she wasn't actively trying to keep him away from that part of the family. Jenny says when Logan came home from that meeting, he told her all about it. He didn't try to hide that he was there and she had no reason to be upset with him anyway. This conflicts with Tina saying he didn't want his grandmom to find out he was there. On May 19th, 2016. Ginny is up getting ready for work and hears Logan come in through the garage. That's how she knew he had been out all night. She said he appeared nervous and excited. He tells her he had an epiphany about himself. She's like, well, let's talk about it, but not right now. I got to get to work. It didn't seem like it was anything urgent. She said he could talk to her about it later on that day once she's home from work. When she comes home, Logan isn't there. His car, which is a 1996 Chrysler Sebring, is gone. She figures he's just out and about. But the next day, which is May 20th, he still hasn't returned home, so she's beginning to worry. She pinged his phone, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with how that works, but I've done this with my son back in the day. You can go to your Find My iPhone app, and it shows you the phone's exact location, like within a few inches. I think she was doing it a different way, where it just shows you the general area. Ginny sees Logan's phone is pinging off of a tower near Olympia, so she's relieved because that's near his mother's house. She figures he's just visiting his mom. Logan was known to go over there, but spending the night wasn't something he typically did, so that would be a very rare occurrence that he would stay the night at his mom's house. The next day is Saturday, and Ginny still hadn't heard from Logan, and he hadn't come home. Chloe, his sister, reaches out to Hannah, her mom, and asks if Logan had been there. Hannah said Logan hasn't been to her house at all recently, and she hadn't seen him. Now Ginny is freaking out. It's Saturday morning, and Ginny drives to the Tumwater Police Station to file a missing persons report. And this is the first time I've ever heard of this. The police department was closed for the weekend. The door is locked, and no one is in there. What kind of police department cl closes on the weekend? <laughs> anyway, Ginny's only other option would be to call 911, but she doesn't want to do that just yet. Instead, she decides that she would just wait until Monday when the police department opens and then file a missing persons report. On Monday, the police take down the important info, such as his height, his weight, where he was last seen. Ginny says the last time she had talked to him was on Thursday, which was five days before. She gives them detailed info about Logan's car, such as the tag number and the VIN number. They run a search in the database to see if it had any hits recently, and were surprised to learn the car was seen on May 20th, which was one day after Logan talked to Ginny at the kitchen table that morning. They tell her it was found abandoned by state police on Interstate 5. It was crashed into the median, but it wasn't badly damaged. It just kind of came to a halt at the median wall and put a good scrape on the front left side. Interstate 5 is this super long highway that goes from Mexico all the way to Canada. The portion of Interstate 5 that the car was found was at mile marker 92 near Tumwater, so it wasn't really far from home. It was like 20, 25 miles. So they sent Ginny to the tow yard where the car was impounded and she did exactly what is the worst possible thing she could do. I'm sure she didn't realize the importance though, so I'm not going to give her shit for this. Ginny was given the keys and drove the car home. The car was never processed. The car is super contaminated now from Ginny driving at home. The tow truck driver, I'm sure, has his DNA and fingerprints all over the place. My forensic side is just cringing right now. Ginny goes through the car, which should have been done by a forensics ex expert, but it wasn't, so we've got this grandmother doing her own investigation in the car. She finds items inside that make it more sad and confusing. 
She finds Logan's wallet with his debit card and his driver's license. She finds $20 in cash. She also finds his cell phone, which makes her worry the most. There were also bags of groceries on the passenger seat, and they contain power bars and snacks. Ginny goes to police and says Logan would never leave his belongings in the car, and could they please process the car for evidence? She is told it's too late to process the car since it's been significantly contaminated by her and others from the tow yard. But now they're interested more in his disappearance since they realize this is all very suspicious. This case went from a young man who hadn't returned home to a serious missing persons case. And they assign a detective to handle the case. They reach out to emergency services to see if any calls had came in on May 20th from that area about a Chrysler Sebring. It's a good thing they did because they're surprised to learn that three calls to 911 came in during that time about this car. Callers state that a vehicle was veering across lanes of traffic on I-5 with no regard for anyone. One caller stated it appeared there wasn't even anyone driving the car. People are just narrowly missing the car as they drove by. The vehicle came to a stop once it hit the concrete barrier on the shoulder of the fast lane. Another caller stated that the car was stopped on the right shoulder. This gives me like major chills. A tall, slender man who was white with red or brown hair crawled into the passenger seat and exited the passenger door before the car rolled out into traffic before coming to a halt on the left shoulder. This man obviously doesn't fit the profile of Logan, who is black. It's believed the man climbed into the passenger seat and got out. When he was going from the driver to the passenger seat, he likely hit the gear shift somehow, which popped it into gear and sent the car rolling into lanes of traffic. They say the man sprinted into the woods next to the highway. The witness was given a photo of Logan and asked if this was the same man he had seen exiting the car, and he said, no, absolutely not. This man was white. They do a two-mile search of the area with scent dogs and cadaver dogs looking for signs of Logan or this other mysterious man, but nothing turned up. They also used heat-seeking technology over the woods in a helicopter to see if perhaps Logan was in there somewhere. It's noted this area of woods that the man ran into wasn't very big. There were small businesses within a mile or two of it. So they have no evidence of Logan anywhere, so they have to do the investigation from the drawing board. This involves searching Logan's house. They take his computer and process his bedroom and his cell phone that was left in the car. They can see that Logan was kind of a withdrawn person who didn't talk to many people. They did find communications with a woman who they contacted, and she said her and Logan met on a dating app, but they never met in person. They had just communicated through text and online. She also said they had no plans to meet anytime soon. The news of Logan's disappearance is spreading around the county, and someone called in to report that they spotted a man who was six foot tall on May 20th, the day after Logan went missing. The caller stated that they were driving and saw a man who was walking at 3 a.m. in this area that is known for crime and drugs. They stated the man was naked from the waist down and appeared confused and disoriented. Since this is an area known for drugs, it could have been someone else or it could really have been Logan. We don't know. We know that Logan's substance of choice was marijuana, nothing else. His friends and family say he wouldn't touch hard drugs. Marijuana was legal in Washington in 2012, which is four years before this story takes place. Washington and Colorado were the first two states to legalize marijuana for recreational use. But Logan wasn't old enough to purchase it on his own since you have to be 21. He had to buy it the old-fashioned way where you meet a dealer somewhere. I don't know why this naked man sighting is brought up in Logan's case every time I read about it. The caller wasn't even sure that the person was black, but many feel there's a possibility that this could have been Logan. One week after Logan disappears, detectives thought they had something huge. Logan's Facebook mysteriously comes to life. It shows a check-in at Olympia Airport. 
it ended up being an anniversary post from one year prior. It was like an automatic thing that Facebook did. But this sparks a new theory and has his family wondering if maybe Logan took off to Saudi Arabia to meet his birth father. The problem is that Logan's driver's license, which was his form of ID, was in his vehicle. His passport was in his bedroom and it was expired. He would need both of those things to travel internationally. There were no leads for a long time. In May of 2016, Logan had been missing for a year. The family again begins hanging flyers and just trying to refresh everyone, you know, a year later that Logan is still missing. If you saw anything that day on the highway, please come forward. The detective assigned to Logan's case gets a call from a woman who claims she saw Logan the day he disappeared on the highway, which makes me wonder why she waited an entire year to say anything about it. She claims she saw Logan's car on the right shoulder parked with Logan standing at the trunk and two Caucasian men standing next to him. One man was described as tall with thin blonde hair cut into a bowl cut and wearing a tank top that appeared to be too small for him and capris. That's her description. A sketch artist drew the depiction of what this person is supposed to look like and it's nightmare inducing. The other Caucasian man, which she didn't get a good look at, had shoulder length blonde hair and was wearing a flannel and jeans. You got to remember, these details she is giving are what she saw when she was passing them at 60 miles per hour. Picture yourself driving down the highway and seeing someone on the shoulder and trying to recall exactly what you saw. Now, make it be one year later. It seems kind of strange. I can't even remember what the cashier at Wawa, who I had a 30-second conversation with yesterday, looked like. When she was returning home from work, she saw the vehicle parked in the same spot with the hood up and nobody was with the vehicle. I don't know why the hood would have been up since the car was in good operating condition. Remember, Ginny drove it home. The sketch of the man she described was circled around the state, but didn't generate any leads. Also in 2017, Chloe's boyfriend, Jake, was arrested for violation of probation. He goes to jail and police figure now would be a good time to sit and question him about Logan. He says he has no idea where Logan is and he wasn't involved. He just happened to live in the same house. They ask him if he would be willing to take a polygraph, and he agrees to it. During the polygraph, they ask if he had anything to do with Logan's disappearance. Did he harm Logan? Does he know where Logan is? He responded no to all their questions. He passed the polygraph, and police do not consider him a suspect. I think it's important to point out that Logan has a severe allergy to peanuts. He's one of those people that can touch a peanut and end up in the hospital. He has to carry an EpiPen with him at all times, and he didn't have it on him when he went missing. Logan's uncle Mike, who is a retired police officer who has done a ton of work in this case, said, You can sit there and work your mind all night long coming up with scenarios. The circumstances are rather unusual. I wonder what exactly the epiphany was that Logan had that he wanted to tell his grandmother about that morning. I don't want to believe this was a crying out suicide attempt, but we can't rule anything out with this case. Try to remember back to when you were 19. Remember saying dramatic things because things seemed hard at the time. I know I do. Everything seems hard when you're that age. Logan loved his car and washed it frequently and took really good care of it. I can't imagine him just leaving it on the side of the road in reckless condition. Also, what about the caller who stated he saw a white man climb out of the passenger seat? Remember, like the woman who called in, this was while driving by. It's hard to imagine he saw a whole lot, but he says that he did. One problem was that, remember Logan had bags of snacks in his car from the grocery store? The bags were on the passenger seat and appeared that they hadn't been disturbed. They weren't smushed granola bars or anything like that. So how can he be climbing all over the passenger seat and not disturb these bags of groceries? The groceries weren't somewhere else in the car and Ginny moved them up to the passenger seat when she drove the car home from the tow yard. She said they were sitting on the passenger seat the whole time. 
I wonder about these snacks if they were known to be snacks that Logan liked to eat. For example, if I found a bag of groceries in my son's car and they were healthy whole grain bars and celery sticks, I would know Michael didn't purchase these. If they were mint chocolate candy bars and red velvet pop tarts, I would know these are definitely purchased by him. The sightings of the vehicle on the highway are where I get the most confused because they're just so bizarre. Two people stated they saw the car veering across multiple lanes. One says a white man got out of the passenger side and runs into the woods before the car begins moving again. A year later, a woman says she saw a black man standing with two white men on the shoulder at the rear of the vehicle. I don't think these people were lying, but I wonder if they're just so focused on these callers that we're not looking anywhere else. I don't want to butcher or discredit these sightings and theories, but I feel like I'm going to because there's so much confusion. I don't think robbery was involved since they didn't take his car, his wallet, cash, or his cell phone, but the theories that the family has are varying and conflict with one another. Ginny says Logan was smoking pot and could have gotten mixed up with the wrong people. Remember, pot was legal in Washington. Logan was just underage and had to find ways to purchase it, much like a lot of us used to purchase alcohol before we turned 21. Other family members say Jake, his sister's boyfriend, may have had something to do with Logan disappearing, but Jake was cleared by police and passed a polygraph. As well, I don't think Jake has the skills and ability to make a person disappear for the last six years and leave zero evidence behind. Some think he, he wanted to start over with the knowledge of his African-American side of the family. The family is pretty conflicted with their theories and kind of at odds with one another, but both sides agree they just want Logan to come home. I read one theory that Logan may have had car trouble, called for a tow truck, and then the tow truck driver who came was the white male. He sees this as an opportunity to kidnap and kill Logan. The problem with this is that it's difficult to kidnap a six-foot man who is athletic. As well, we know Logan didn't call a tow truck since his phone records were scanned and there was no call to a tow company. As well, the car ran just fine when Jenny picked it up from the tow yard. Another theory is that Logan had some sort of mental breakdown. We know Logan had a lot on his mind and his life was very different than it was in high school. He felt lonely, and like every missing person case, there's always a chance that Logan committed suicide. This doesn't explain why his car was abandoned on the highway with a white man getting out of it, though. I don't want to insult Logan by assuming he committed suicide. We tend to do that with a lot of these cases, but I can't rule it out. It's also possible that Logan abandoned his car that day and started a new life somewhere else. That's super difficult to do with no friends, no money, no ID, no car, but it's also a best case scenario right now and also the same theory that's in every missing adult case. Think about how many missing adult men I've discussed with you guys and mentioned maybe they went away to start a new life somewhere. To wrap this up, the vehicle was found abandoned on the left inside shoulder. There was a man seen exiting the passenger door and sprinting into the woods. Because of this, I feel like foul play was definitely involved. I know these sightings were very fast as drivers went by during their commute, but multiple callers stated the car was operating in a bizarre way by drifting across lanes and appeared empty. Detective Frawley, who is the lead investigator in this case, says this case still keeps him awake at night. Logan Schindelman is described as being six feet tall with black hair that is normally shaved and brown eyes and weighing roughly 150 to 190 pounds. He was last seen wearing a black windbreaker, white shirt, jeans, and Nike shoes. If alive today in 2022, Logan is getting ready to turn 26 years old. There are currently no persons of interest. I feel like someone out there has the answers and just hasn't said anything. There have been community yard sales and fine Logan bracelet sales to help generate reward money for Logan's return. Something I found interesting is that Logan still holds records from his time as a defensive back at Tumwater High School. That's it for this week. Again, all my sources are listed in the description area. Take care and much love to you all.